So hello everybody and welcome to this episode of CFO 4.0. An interesting one for you today, definitely a global one. Um, I am speaking to David Brandeis, who is CFO at Powtoon. So he is currently dialing in from Tel Aviv, which I think has to be a first for me on this podcast. So uh, <laughs> welcome, David. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Hannah. Um, so, so tell us a little bit um, about yourself, David, because you're not originally from Israel, are you? That's right. So I'm originally Swiss. Um, I moved to Israel uh, just after high school and um, I came here for a gap year program and decided to stay. And I started here and have been working in, uh, in Israel ever since. Wow. And, and um, have you, you know, have you been back home? Have you experienced sort of working anywhere else? But Israel, have you always been sort no. of in your professional life in Israel? Yeah, that's right. So obviously I go back home, visit my family, um, but uh, my professional life has been in Israel only. Fabulous. So well, tell us a little bit about your journey. What does a typical CFO journey look like on the <laughs> other side of the world? Well, actually, I wouldn't say my journey was a typical journey. <laughs> Okay. Um, so basically, um, I worked in uh, all kind of different finance jobs and uh, as an analyst in an investment firm and so on. And then I decided I want to become, uh, um, you know, an, or move into the direction of becoming a CFO. And uh, basically started after my degree and after having worked two, three years um, in different jobs, I decided to basically become and train as an accountant. Um, and I did that in Israel in a UK firm. So basically my firm was doing accounts, a few of them were actually Israeli companies which had subsidiaries uh, or branches or any activity in the UK. And so I actually trained to become a UK accountant in Israel, being a Swiss originally. That's basically my non-conventional story. <laughs> um, yeah. And then Absolutely. basically I did my ACCA training uh, in that firm. And uh, when I joined, I think I was a um, member number four of that firm. So it was qu quite small. And with time we grew and, uh, you know, I brought on my own clients. And uh, it's part of the services that we offered that actually I introduced to one of these clients is to be a CFO as an outsourced CFO service. And uh, after doing that for a year or two, um, you know, I realized this is what I really enjoy. I enjoy, you know, being more involved than just at the end of the year doing an audit or, uh, you know, being involved on a periodical basis. But I like to be, you know, in it on a, on a more consistent basis. And, and then I decided to basically join one of, uh, one of my clients, which is Pazin. Amazing. So, so you made that transition. So I've heard of Powtoon even before we obviously asked you to come on this, um, the show. So tell right. me a bit about your journey with Powtoon. What, what is sort of the, the journey looked like for the past couple of years? Right. So Powtoon uh, is uh, basically a bootstrap company. So, you know, we don't have uh, in-house resources so much. So the finance function was pretty much outsourced um, until I basically uh, came in house. So the journey was mainly to come in and understand what's going on and basically start building a department inside the company, which obviously the company was growing. And so there was now a need to have an in-house finance department. Um, so that's how it started. And then uh, with time, I hired a bookkeeper, um, you know, brought in different systems, uh, introduced new controls. And very quickly I was, you know, the finance department was, uh, was built in, in the company. Brilliant. How long have you been with Powtoon now? Uh, almost two years. Fabulous. So you're getting into that sort of scale stage. And and it must have been just after COVID, or was it during COVID that you were sort of taken on board? Yeah, it was actually the beginning uh, of COVID. It was, hold on, let me think. No, actually it was in April 21. So it's been like a year of COVID. Um yeah, but it was it was definitely not a normal transition. Let's put it that way. When you start working from home in a new job, definitely not the you know the normal start. But uh, yeah, yeah, nevertheless, I think it was quite a smooth one. And is your entire team based in Tel Aviv? You know, how, is it quite a global organization? Tell us a little bit about the internal setup. Sure. Um, so, uh, basically we have our R and D center here in Israel, uh, it's about uh, 70 people. And then we have a sales team and customer success team in the UK. Um, 
And then we have like little bits and pieces all over the world. So we have a support team in the Philippines. We have uh, some contractors in the Ukraine, mainly developers, um, and and then even some other countries where we have uh, you know some individuals working with Patum. Um, it's a UK company as such, so the headquarters are really in the UK with an Israeli subsidiary, which basically um, is for mainly the R&D. Fabulous. And, and obviously working very much cross-border, how have you find, found that as an organization? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's, uh, you know, for me, a UK company was a bread and butter. So I was happy that the UK company was the headquarter, was the parent company. So that's, for me, easier on the Israeli side. I do speak Hebrew, so that made it obviously easier, um, you know, to have the dialect with people that I, or basically, yeah, to be in touch with people that work in Israel, like my bookkeeper is an Israeli, we speak in Hebrew to each other. It's uh, it's great, you know, like you get to know different cultures and work with different people. Um, but I'm happy to say that the finance is all in Israel, so, you know, I don't have to have calls with different time zones and so on, uh, inter- at least for internal calls. Absolutely. And obviously, but your your main management team, it sounds like, is over in the UK. Yeah, so it's it's a mix. So we're both in the UK and Israel. Again, it's just a two hour time difference. So we managed to meet. And anyways, with COVID, you know, everyone was anyway sitting from home. So whether you're sitting in home in the UK or in Israel, you still manage uh, to have these conversations and meetings on the screens and, and it's working well. Yeah, well, we would say it's pretty much the same. I have to say, I think there is a slight distant, uh, difference today with the temperature, as we discussed prior to this podcast. <laughs> so I think it's what, right. minus seven here in the UK, and you've yeah. got a balmy 20 something right. degrees. So. Right, so sometimes we have people taking calls in shorts and t-shirts, and on the other side you have people <laughs> in a winter jacket and the hoodie on. But yeah, besides that. <laughs> it's yeah. pretty similar. So um, I guess that's an interesting concept, isn't it? Because then you've got all, you know, a merging of cultures. Do you find the Israeli and UK culture very different in terms of how people interact? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Israelis are very direct. They're very, you know, open. They're looking for the conversation. Uh, The English people are are rather cold and very, you know, uh, pragmatic and, you know, no emotions and, and so on. So it's uh, definitely interesting to work with these both two cultures. Me being Swiss, I'm, I think Switzerland is more like England. In terms <laughs> definitely of neutral. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, so that's my line, basically. Whenever there's conflict, I'm Swiss, I'm neutral, keep me out of it. Um, but basically, yeah, I know, definitely, different. there is a, you know, different in cultures, but you, and that's just so, mm. it's very nice. They're very diverse, you know, management team. So that's, it's fun. Absolutely. So, so tell me a little bit about how you approach building out your your finance team, because obviously you were person number right. one on the internal front. So that must have been quite tricky, having to do literally the day job as well as Correct. doing the CFO role. Correct. So tell so me a little anyways, bit about I mean, because the starting point was that, you know, it still is a bootstrap company and we are limited in resources for some things. So um, I'm much more hands-on, I would think, than other CFOs might be for the size of our organization. You know, we're about 100 employees. Um, and yet, uh, I sometimes, you know, go down to the level of a general ledger and checking and making sure that our clients are paying us and so on. Um, but I actually enjoy that because I think by doing that, I'm much more involved and up-to-date in what's going on. And I know, you know, what suppliers should be bidding us and what the, we should be bidding our customers. And so by being that involved, I think I have, you know, the oversight that I still should have as a CFO. Um, so, yeah, first of all, it was coming in and understanding what's going on. You know, I was used to have these projects also before my firm where we would consult in a specific item or issue that was arising, what you have and what you got and what still needs to be changed. And then you start looking for how to fix these things. And for me, it was clear that we got from an outsource provider as for an uh, internal person and we had the pension for it. So... We basically decided we would hire a bookkeeper and took some while to find the right person that can do the UK books, Israeli books, but then we found the right person. And and then piece after piece, uh, payroll as well, uh, you know, dealt with that. And and slowly, slowly, we we we, we aligned our horses and we're, we're good to go. And as we scale, we adapt. So, you know, first the bookkeeper was working only 50%, then we put it up 70%, 80%. We find, uh, you know, always new things that come in and the ways obviously also changes that the way we work also have an, an impact on finance as well. So that Thursday, we decided to move that function over. So 
all these kind of things, you know, they evolve all the time and it's just a matter of being open to change and basically going with the flow. And obviously being a bootstrap, part of a bootstrap company, it can be sometimes hard to balance the strategic and the hands-on. So how do you manage it? What's your secret? You know, there is a busier and less busier times of demand to, to do more the strategic kind of things. Um, and again, obviously, sometimes these things overlap. So, you know, whenever uh, we go towards the end of the year, we plan next year. So my time goes heavily into the planning for the next. Um, yeah, again, I mean, we manage the workload fine. And, and basically, it's just a matter of being very organized and being Swiss. I try to be as organized as I can. <laughs> And just uh, and just getting it done. And what do you think is the re- how much of a requirement does the business have from you at a strategic level? Do you think you know, like it, they obviously so. needs, yeah, they obviously need it because they've given they wanted somebody with that experience. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I you know, I think that the major point I realize is that finance can't just be an outside function. With, for example, uh, you know, we were having made the. In the sales process, we had no order for it. So we would send out quotes and then invoices and payments. And having come from an audit, I knew that, you know, you need an order form to say, what are you actually buying? What's your contract time? You know, we need to revenue recognition and so on. So I started giving recommendations how we should sell. And actually realized, oh, it's much easier to sell when you have an order form. So I got involved in the order forms. Then we also have, uh, you know, our sales serve site where we basically sell without any people intervention and training. And people put in their credit cards and basically buy a plan online. So also there, it goes down to purchases and license agreements with our suppliers. And really, I feel like I'm involved, you know, almost everywhere. So that's what I really realized when I came in-house. You can't have finance just being... I mean, again, if you just want to have a bookkeeper and gives you a monthly management account, then that's one thing. But if you want really a finance person driving uh, in business, they need to be in-house, they need to be involved. And and really, I am in the nitty gritty of, of a lot of things. So definitely, there is a, the, the ask to be planning, um, having realistic models that you know work um, beyond the just what the gut feeling is around the, the exact team. So yeah, definitely. And from a, you're talking a lot about planning. So obviously, as a software company, there's a there's a lot of um, challenges at the moment, particularly with planning and a volatile environment. So how have you guys approached it internally? So we're, um, you know, we obviously do a lot of modeling um, and and you just, uh, you know, it, often you have a funnel, right? So if, if you see you see problems or you see a slowdown in the funnel from the top of the funnel, you know this will have an impact three months, six months, nine months down the line. So it's not that it comes a surprise with three, six, nine months down the line because you can see already if there is a change in your top metrics that you're looking at. So, uh, you know, we just need, in, in the models that we do, we just need to take action, take that into account. And do you guys as an organization focus, like you say, very much on the top level metrics? So do you have an end-to-end KPI cycle? Well, how, you know? Yeah, I mean, it, it's both. So obviously, being bootstrapped, you know, cash is king. We can't pay salaries if they are in the traffic. So uh, obviously, you know, we, we do track uh, the bottom line uh, or the cash very, very intensely. But as well, other metrics as well, you know, we, we especially for a B2P on the self-serve side, you know, we need to track uh, traffic, conversions, user signups, uh, obviously the use of your platform and so on. So I think, you know, our focus is very, very much on both ends. And as finance, how involved are you in that side of things? You know, as you know, go back to that whole bootstrap piece. Are you heavily involved in that reporting and analysis, or do you guys tend to analyze oh, the investment piece? No, it's uh, very much we're involved in as well. Maybe we're not feeding, uh, you know, the model so much, but definitely we are involved sense checking. Uh, you know, uh, the assumptions that the, our head of revenue is making. And definitely we have to be involved in that because in the end of the day, you know, yeah, as a finance, you can probably control your costs more than you can control your revenues, but still you need to make sure you're working off your realistic projections. And how do you feel like um, the whole COVID piece has affected you as an organization? Do you think it's changed the organization? Did you like, because you work with them both before and after they made that transition? Yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, as 
probably in most companies we realize it does still work if, even if you're not sitting physically in a room all together every day. Um, and, you know, this flexibility that employees have do not have so much an impact on their productivity. On the other hand, uh, you know, personally, I feel that, you know, you, especially as a creative company as we are, you do need that physical interaction. You do need to sit in a room, discuss things, and it just uh, it still can't compare a virtual meeting to a, a, a physical meeting. Um, I mean, for us at Powtoon, COVID was a great thing. You know, people went home. They were uh, not engaged as they were before. Employees were not engaged as they were before. So a lot of companies and people look for solutions like Powtoon to basically stay in touch and be able to, um, so with videos and other visual communication. So definitely um, for us, it was great. And again, we use our own tool, right? So we loved our, to create our own videos. I can only imagine and, the creativity uh, that, that comes out in, uh, you know, we've got a thing for gifts in our organization. I can only right. imagine what your, your internal messaging system looks like. Right, right. No, it's fun. It is really fun. And do you, uh, that's a really, do you use Powtoons in finance at all? Uh, to say the truth, uh, well, I do use it. We have, so we have quarterly, uh, like, uh, you know, QBR, so we call them, where basically every department presents to the whole company what, uh, what has been happening in their department. And it's actually mandatory to do that in Powtoon. So, <laughs> so these videos that you create in Powtoon, for the rest of it, not so much, no. But like, yeah, Excel and Powtoon are not a great, uh, you know, match. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Hey, th- th- there's an opportunity for you telling stories <laughs> around your Excel and Powtoon. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so um, obviously, as a um, you know, as a as a SaaS company, um, there's been, obviously been some great growth. It sounds like even out of um, you know COVID and the challenges that face. What do you see as the biggest challenges for you as an organisation at the moment? Um. So, so again, obviously, you know, COVID was great. Now, high tech is facing more of a, a downward trend. So it's a continuously changing environment, which obviously makes projections very, very difficult. Um, so that's obviously one thing, you know, you don't want to, um, over or underestimate, uh, your revenues and costs, which for a bootstrap company, especially, you know, there are not a hundred million sitting in the bank from a VC waiting to be spent. So you need to be very cautious um, on, on your projections. So that's one thing which makes it quite hard. And then obviously, you know, all the rest is, is for me in, in terms of accounting, technical accounting, obviously revenue recognition is always a beast that you need to handle. Uh, you know, we have different kinds of contracts, models, how we sell to our, our customers. And there again, it, it's it's a fact that finance needs to be involved. And, you know, just the salesperson comes up with a new model and starts selling that and doesn't even inform finance, right? And then you see, like, you, I don't know, I have some deals that are based on exports and other deals that are based on contract length and, and so on. And that's an interesting piece because I, I literally had this conversation on one of my recent uh, calls is talking through how sometimes finance can be left picking up the pieces behind sales while they make decisions to hit a number. So how do you manage that as obviously leading that finance function and not wanting to hamper growth, but also needing structure and, you know, some right. strategic direction behind it? For sure. So basically, you know, I I, made, I understood that I, I need a close friend in sales. So sales ops and uh, is basically a very good friend of mine now. And, uh, and we you know we have uh, weekly calls. We go over reports that we built to make sure you know, I'm not missing anything and, and basically that we're up to date with each other. And, um, and it's, and again, going back to the point that I am involved, you know, on reports or we go over monthly deals and all the deals and I do go through them and make sure that we don't miss anything. So it's, it's, it's being involved in detail, but also making sure that, uh, you know, you have the relationships with these people to basically make sure you're on top of them and then up to date. And is that a recent development or is that sort of almost in your head something you focused on right from the beginning because you knew it was going to be necessary? Yeah, I mean, again, revenue recognition for me, I knew that was going to be uh, an issue. You know, we're not, we're not the company, you can't mess around with that. Um, 
And so I knew that's going to be an issue from the beginning. And hence also, you know, I, as I said, I introduced the order for, for example, for the order purpose. So that was an observation I made that we need to make sure we are in line with, you know, what we need to do. So I knew revenue recognition that would be a thing and it's ever evolving and interesting and, uh, and it's giving me a headache. So that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you know, um, it's always interesting. We <laughs> having worked with a lot of SaaS companies, you know, over the years. Um, right. I think revenue recognition and SaaS metrics are their two biggest bugbears. So you're not alone okay. if that's any Good. consolation. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And on a personal level, how did you find the transition from being in practice to obviously working for an organization? Yeah, so, you know, obviously the biggest change was that before I had a, a team, you know, of, of juniors and also uh, seniors that I worked with. And, you know, it was, uh, I felt like I had a big team that I could uh, speak to about my, my issues that I face or things that I do at work. And then I come here and I'm basically for six months or so, I was the only finance person. So, you know, I had no one to discuss uh, internally, at least the issues and things I'm doing. So that was the transition. In terms of um, in terms of the actual work, I I, I really enjoy it. Again, before I, I you know the, the fun thing was to see a lot of different companies, industries, ways of doing things, and 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 doing their audits and books. But again, it was a one touch point. You know, you do a job and you see it again maybe next year or not. And and here. You know, I'm I'm really involved. I'm building processes. I'm adding value, and I, I think that's it's really you know I love it. Amazing. And tell me, obviously, you talk about building processes. You know, and again, that's not something you would traditionally associate with a CFO role as such. That's very much finance operations. So, how do you approach it? Like, do you have formally mapped processes and review? you know, once they've been mapped out or, you know, when you're looking for process improvements, what's your personal? Again, my approach is very much, uh, first of all, understanding what is currently going on and then uh, suggest improvements. And uh, the major point is that you need to involve the people in that process um, when uh, you want to improve something. So obviously, if you don't have like the stakeholders uh, approval of improving or changing something, there's no point of doing it, you know, like do it. There's no point of having a playbook. So, you know, it's under, it's bringing the stakeholders on board and ensuring they understand what are, uh, you know, the, the, the missing things in the current processes and then trying to work out a new thing. And often when they improve the way they work, um, it, they're happily keen to, to take that on and then you don't need much enforcement on that. And and how do you see the future of finance in terms of what are your plans for the finance team within the business over the next few years? So hopefully, you know, if, as the company keeps growing, um, we will hopefully have to hire more people, bring more in-house, have a controller actually and between me and the bookkeeper that uh, can do more of the, you know, detailed and like work that I'm currently still doing. And and hopefully as we expand globally as well, hire you know a global team and and basically expand the finance. Team. And uh, yeah, you really take it global <laughs> this time. <laughs> <laughs> and, exactly. Um, and, I, and I guess that's exactly. that's an interesting piece, isn't it? That conversation between you know even though you're based in Israel, actually being very much in the UK based framework. So how? Have, like is is it very common for that to happen over in Israel? No. Is ACCA the main no. sort of nobody? Tell me a little bit about that. No, so the classic way here is to be a CPA, which you do in your undergrad. You do study accounting, you do two years of a stage, and then you basically um, get the the CPA license. Um, obviously, Israel is a place where many people move to, like I did, and so a lot of people come from different places with their licenses that they already had. And not many actually convert to the Israeli CPA because, again, a debit is a debit and a credit is a credit. So that's, you know, not going to change whether you're in the UK or in Israel. Uh, but again, depending on what you do, obviously, if you want to work in an Israeli audit firm, then you probably would have to convert to the Israeli CPA. Um, but yeah, again, I mean, the, the, the knowledge is the knowledge and that doesn't change so much from country to country. Again, it depends. Tax laws obviously are very different. 
but you have experts you work with um, externally, so that's fine. Absolutely balancing the two. And yeah, very interesting to hear that you qualified ACCA. <laughs> um, that's that's an interesting step. So obviously you're you're on a journey um, you know, with the with the organization as well. And but if if anyone you know, if anyone's listened to this, perhaps they're in practice and looking to the make the step into that, mm-hmm. you know, either working in a business or working into a CFO role, what advice would you give them in terms of getting your yourself ready um for that opportunity as much as anything else right um i think it's it's mainly trying to go beyond just doing you know simple bookkeeping or vat returns or a one-year audit and actually try and and get more involved with the client right so if there is a way of uh you know having a client where you go in once a week and meet with them and and go beyond just accounting but really finance right so Show me your KPIs, show me your metrics of uh, your sales teams and, and basically start trying to dig into that more. Um, or, yeah, I mean, if that's not available, then try and look for maybe even a bit of junior position in a company and start as an assistant controller, controller and work your way up. Um, but definitely it's uh, what gave me the big jump is to be exposed to an accompany more than just doing your end accounts or audits or whatever it is. And was that a personal choice? Isn't it something you wanted to, or did you just kind of happen to end up there and discovered you really loved it? Yeah, so now we had a client where um, uh, he was given to me and that just over time developed to be more involved. And then I was owning that client. And then I brought on Paltoon as a client actually um, for that purpose to begin with. So um no i was actually kind of thrown into it but um yeah happened to work out. <laughs> it's all worked out <laughs> perfectly in the end <laughs> yes and of course um you know as an organization what are you most excited for because um you guys have um had, uh, got a new parent company you know what's the what does the future for paltoon look like Right. So, uh, yeah, we just launched every, our rebrand. Uh, the parent brand is now called Vision Native. And basically uh, what we're doing is kind of uh, uh, splitting the, the self-serve side. So when people like individuals or SMBs and, and, and sole traders and so on, they buy a license online. That's kind of one product. And then we're going to have another different name. Um, and basically we want to, you know, expand this, the products that we have and basically uh, grow both sides as possible and, and basically, you know, go to market with a, a bit of different approach. And it goes back to accounting as well. So, you know, now we're going to start doing different profit centers with the different brands and so on. So again, the need of being involved is, is just super important. And the future is going to be hopefully very exciting. Um, you know, there is a big ask um, for tools like how to um, internal comms, HR, learning and development, sales enablement, all of these things um, is is uh, facilitated by a tool like Paltoon where you can visually communicate and, and there's nothing like a video, like, you know, a 10-page PowerPoint or PDF or whatever will never be able to transmit the same uh, like a one-minute video. So, um, yeah, I do believe a lot in visual communication and the... Uh, yeah, I hope the future is great. Sounds exciting. So if, um, obviously, if our listeners want to learn more about Paltoon, right, and and I, you know, sure. I've explored it as a tool previously, so I can definitely say have a look. Um, <laughs> tell us a little bit, a bit more about how they can find out about it. Uh, very easy. You go on the internet and you <laughs> and look for Paltoon.com. Paltoon stands for PowerPoint and Cartoon, so that's like the mix uh-huh. of them. So that's how uh, how the name came up. Um, so yeah, Paltoon.com, that's where you find us. Um, you can buy a free license and play it. Buy, get a free license, play around with it. And uh, and if you like it, we can, you know, upsell you to, to more. Hey, I'm, I'm sure there is a use case there for finance to tell stories through cartoons, right? There you go. A personal challenge for you, David. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. It's been really interesting to understand the sort of almost a cultural differences piece as well and the, and the journey that you've been on. So thank you for sharing it with us. Thank you so much for having me, Hannah.